Hello, everybody. It's Nathaniel Avila reporting from Greater Orlando, and I'm here joined uh, with Timbrel Hildebrand from Dallas Fort Worth. Uh, I'm in Arlington. Oh, Arlington, my fault. From Arlington. <laughs> and uh, we are here to parlay. Am I right? Um, I, I mean, we're, we're here. I don't know if that really. Yeah, sure, sure, yeah. We're here to parlay, so see to the captain of the Caribbean, because that's what we're talking about today. Pirates right. of the Caribbean. All right. So, uh, what what did you think of the film? Oh man, I love this movie. It's one of my favorites. It's your favorite film. Did it's you... one of my favorites. It's one of your favorite. Why do you like it so much? Oh, it's just really good, solid storytelling. Like it's a nice story, and also it's entertaining. You've got likable, dynamic characters. Or like, I wouldn't call them super dynamic, but it's just, it's a really great adventure movie. It's its sort of like that sweeping kind of uh, fairy tale feel, and I, I really enjoy it. It's got great characters, great performances, great music, great effects. It's just, it's an all-around just good movie. Oh, yeah. I know that uh, Johnny Depp got nominated for an Oscar for this film. Funny enough, that was actually his first Oscar nomination. Really? <laughs> Nothing before. Yeah. He didn't get Finding Neverland before? That came after. Oh, okay. I also got nominated for uh, Best Makeup, Best Sound Mixing, Best Sound Editing, and Best Visual Effects. So, yeah, that sounds about pr right. Pretty good stuff. So, the official logline for this film is that Blacksmith... Uh, blacksmith Will Turner, played by Orlando Bloom, teams up with an eccentric pirate, quote unquote, Captain Jack Sparrow, uh, played by uh, Johnny Depp, to save his love, the governor's daughter, daughter, uh, who is played by Kieran Knightley, uh, from Jack's former pirate allies, who are now undead. Ooh. How old were you when this uh, film came out? Um, well, it came out in 2003, probably in the summer, so I was probably about three years old. You were three? I watched it. Yeah, I was it, three years old. I watched it, it came out, I was nine, and I remember I watched it in the theaters when it came out. And, really? Yeah, it came out, and I remember I watched it because I, I thought it was, like, so cool, because it was like, whoa, skeleton pirates, that's super cool. Uh, but my sister didn't want to see it because she thought it was too scary. But I went, <laughs> I went anyway, and I was like, wow, that's pretty awesome. That was actually a pretty uh, fun film and not that scary. Uh, it's also, yeah. It was also the first PG-13 rated film, Disney film. Are you sure about that? Yes, I'm 100% sure. You can look oh, it up. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. So it is the very first PG-13 Disney film, and it is pretty awesome. So uh, some backstory of the film some history because it's a pretty pretty interesting history uh so let's see uh so the story of the pirates of the caribbean start off in like the 1990s where two screenwriters by the name of ted elliott and terry rocio uh wanted to create like a pirate film with a supernatural spin on it so they ended up getting a, a job by uh, a guy named Jay Walpert to write a script based on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. Uh, and then, let me see. And the original story actually had uh, Turner as a prison guard uh, instead of a blacksmith. And he really? released, yeah, and he releases Jack Sparrow to rescue Elizabeth, who is being held for ransom by a, a, a pirate captain named Blackheart instead of Barbosa. So that yeah, was that, that changed. Oh yeah, it's pretty much the it's pretty similar still. I mean, he still he did bust him out of prison in the in the actual film, uh, but he but uh, the captain was not uh, holding her for ransom. Because then that whole thing with the Aztec gold and the curse and all that. Uh, yeah. And at the time, Disney wanted to, uh, didn't know whether or not to send it to theaters or direct to video. 
Um, but if they were to send it into theaters, they originally wanted Matthew McConaughey to play Jack Sparrow. Really? Oh, Matthew yeah. McConaughey? Yeah. Uh, the reason why is because uh, because he because McConaughey looked a lot like uh, another actor named Burt Lancaster, who inspired that version that script's interpretation of the character. So that's that was the reason. Uh, but interesting. Yeah, and if Disney wanted to go to direct video, uh, to go the direct video route, they would have cast uh, Christopher Walken as Jack Sparrow. Hmm. Well, would you agree with that? No, I, I think it turned out nice the way it is. Yeah. Um, so, as the years went on, uh, let me see. Da, 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 da. They got uh, Jerry Bruckheimer to join the project, uh, but he rejected the script that was made because it was, quote unquote, a straight pirate movie. So he actually came up with the idea of come making it into like a curse, a supernatural curse, because that's what was described in the beginning of the theme park ride. So that's what he wanted to do. So. In May of 2002, he got Verbinski to make the uh, to actually direct the film, and he wanted to uh, use modern technology to resurrect uh, the pirate genre, which hasn't been done since the golden <laughs> age of Hollywood. So, and he wanted to uh, make it pretty like funny and scary, also. So. As a result, he wanted Jim Carrey to play Jack Sparrow. Interesting. Yeah. So, as a result, uh, unfortunately, uh, the pir the production for Pirates of the Caribbean conflicted with Bruce Almighty, so he couldn't he couldn't play Jack Sparrow. So, there's that. Uh, so, as as the time went on. Uh, Disney was pretty, they weren't really uh, excited for Pirates of the Caribbean because uh, the year that year the Country Bears came out and it was a major box office failure. So they were like, we should probably shut down Pirates of the Caribbean because that was also based off a ride and, we, and that showed to be not profitable. So there goes that. So, in the last bit, att bit attempt, Verbinski uh, told his concept artist like to keep working on the picture, uh, like the film. And when Eisner came to visit the CEO of Disney, uh, he was really like blown away by the concept art and everything. So he was like, uh, "Yes, let's just continue making the film." And then the film was saved. Interesting. Oh, I didn't yeah. know any of that. Yeah, uh, it's pretty interesting stuff. So, uh, what did you think about like the CGI of the film? Oh my goodness, yeah. This, this is the kind of effects that I think have really stood the test of time. And I mean, um, this this isn't even the best example in the Pirates franchise. In the second movie, the with the motion capture, it was still relatively in its uh, you know birth. With Davy Jones, that was that that stuff still looks amazing today. And those movies are, uh, what they're they're over ten years old. They're over a decade old, and that it's really incredible to see how those effects have really stood the test of time because you don't always see that in movies that came out in the early two thousands. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I because I remember it was one of the films that was made by Industrial Light and Magic. They're the people who made the uh, CGI on it and they were the people who go on to make like all the the marvel cgi animations and all that kind of stuff uh and when i was watching it i was like wow this could definitely i could you could have told me that this was made this year and i would have believed it because of the, yeah, because the animation mean, was good. so good oh yeah um and the thing is it was very difficult because it was very also impressive because uh, the they would have to like replicate 
the terms of like the performances and the characteristics of the actors, but like as skeletons. Uh, oh, they and, didn't use motion capture. Uh, not really, because I don't think motion capture was a thing yet. Um, no, it was a thing. I mean, they had done Lord of the Rings at that point with Smeagol and stuff. Oh yes, that's right. Um, it says here. I think on... it was a bit of both because I I was watching. Uh, I believe that like when they were doing the big scene at the end, where like the the pirates storm the you know the English ship and the English soldiers come and you know try to fight them off. Uh, the actor was ta- the actor who played uh, Norrington was talking about how uh, well you have to learn how to do the tango without your partner. So they were they were shooting it with them doing the sword fights, but they weren't always with their partners. So. Perhaps some of it was, like, just straight-up animation, but I, I feel like they used motion capture at some point. All right. uh, by the way, that was a solid British accent. That was <laughs> so, Lots of fun. Yeah. And, oh, I'm, I'm reading all, I've been reading off the Wikipedia, by the way. And, but, and it says here that the, uh, there was motion capture that was being used. Okay, I figured, because you can usually tell... Oh, yeah, and it says here that uh, the film finished four months before it was supposed to release, like it wrapped production-wise. So, oh, my word. So we only had – so it says here that Verbinski spent 18-hour days editing it and, wow. and, and rendering 600 effect shots, and 250 of them was just digitally removing, like, modern sailboats and stuff. But that was that's still a lot. And, that's crazy. Oh yeah, he really put a lot of work in it. Uh, so, what did you guys? What do you think about the whole concept of piratism in this film? How do you think it portrayed piratism? Piracy. I mean, piracy? I mean, piracy. That's right. I I think there's something very like there's just something kind of timeless about the story that's in this, and people might say that it's cliche or, um, you know, a little bit too textbook, but I think that what Pirates of the Caribbean did was a super original idea that we don't get to see very much anymore. Like, they took something that was cre- related to Disney, but this is something entirely new that they created. It's not based off of a grim fairy tale or based off of a legend or based off of a Shakespeare play. It's, it's, it's their own original story with these new characters, um, you know, Jack and Will and Elizabeth and they have pretty much all the good qualities for an uh, what, what you would consider to be a good kind of epic adventure movie. You know, you have you have the romantic tension with, between Will and Elizabeth, which was which I would argue is kind of the heart of the film because it's what sort of stirs ev- like spurns everything on. But then you have you have themes of betrayal with Jack and his crew. And, um, you know, the character Jack Sparrow himself is a very interesting character because as an audience member, you're not really sure, can we trust him? Is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? You know, is he going to sell out, you know, our hero, our heroes or is he a hero? And it's just, you, you have those good archetypal characters. Like you have Will, who's the, like the, the central good character. He's always out for someone else. He's not out for himself ever. And you have Elizabeth, who, is a great example of a strong female character, I feel like, that you get to see because she she's not your classic damsel in distress. She doesn't just need to be saved. She she comes and she fights alongside Will and helps him take out the pirates. But yeah, like, this story in general, it's just a really good, solid story. And that's what makes it so timeless, and I think that's why people can still enjoy it now because it's just, you get swept away in the adventure with the, the, the you know, it's not just a pirate movie. It's, it's a supernatural movie, and it's not just an adventure story. It's a love story. It's, I think it just has all the components of a really good, pleasing, epic adventure. I really, I agree. And I think Roger Ebert said it the best in terms of, like, what he said about Johnny Depp's performance as Jack Sparrow. And he says that his performance is as original, and it's every atom. There has never been a pirate, or for that matter, a human being like this in any other movie. And his and he says that his behavior shows a lifetime of rehearsal. Would you agree with that statement? I, I'd say it's a very. I think it was a very interesting take. I think it was very unique. I would say that. I, I'd say that it was something new. Because I mean, there weren't 
before Pirates of the Caribbean, I mean, like, I can't think of many other pirate movies that, or things that you would really consider pirate movies with the exception of maybe Treasure Island, or if you, if you really want to stretch it, I guess Princess Bride could kind of be construed as a pirate movie just in the, just in uh, regard to, like, the swashbucklingness of the whole thing. Um, but yeah, I think Johnny Depp's performance is definitely one of the strongest my, it's, it's definitely the strongest performance, with the exception of maybe Jeffrey Rush playing Barbosa. And when you have these two guys who are both very, very talented actors playing playing scenes together, it's just it's wonderful to watch. Anytime Jack and Barbosa are, you know, uh, conversing, it's great to watch because you you just see these two very different characters. Because you have Barbosa, who's kind of the you know your regular idea of a pirate captain, you know, kind of the staple pirate captain, if you will, and then you have Jack, who's more of a, a rebel, you know, he's less um, the, the, the stereotype for um, a pirate captain, and it's interesting to see Jack's kind of cavalier nature and unpredictability, you know, juxtaposed with Barbosa's kind of like, a, you know, strong, controlling mannerism. Oh, yeah, and there's this, also this idea of uh, the relationship between the fantasy and the reality, like legends and how it can become bigger than reality. And I think it's mostly shown in the scene where Gibbs tells Turner about how Jack escaped the island, that he just w stayed there for seven days and seven nights and he used his back hair to tie up a bunch of sea turtles and made a raft from it. Uh, but it turned out he, he the island was just a, a a stop for an alcohol company, and they just found him there, and that's what really happened. It wasn't as heroic as the original story. So what do you think the relationship is there? You mean the relationship between, like, fantasy and reality? Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't... Personally, I don't... I feel like that's a huge theme. I feel like it's pretty straightforward what's fantasy and what's reality here, but I do think it was interesting that we get to meet Jack Sparrow, and when we first meet Jack Sparrow, if you try to watch this movie with an objective eye, because nowadays if someone says Jack Sparrow, even people who haven't seen the movie will probably say, oh yeah, that's the pirate guy, I know who he is. Um, but I mean, you watch this movie objectively, and you're meeting this new character, he's kind of funky, he doesn't look like what a regular pirate would look like, you know, and... Um, getting to, um, but, but it's interesting because he clearly has all this lore built up around him because the minute uh, Norrington meets him, he's like, oh, Jack Sparrow, you're the worst pirate I've ever heard of. He's like, oh, but you have heard of me. And so it's interesting to see how Elizabeth has clearly, like, read about these stories and knows these stories, and then when they're stuck on this island, she's super disappointed because he's not this great, amazing thing that she thought he was. Like, a lot of his, um, like, his greatest uh, escape was all pretty much a lie. It was just luck of the draw. He happened to be marooned on an island where rum runners had had stuff there. Oh, yeah. Um, another thing, I think it also has to do with what you said earlier about uh, the legend of Jack Sparrow but, uh, as opposed to what he really was. Um, kind of like how this film kind of like goes on to like the legend of, of piracy and like the the cool adventureness of it, and like the fantastical version of it, as opposed to what it really was, which was, according to history, they were really bad people, like they are really terrible people. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> and I think in this movie they don't really. I wouldn't say that they very much glamorized piracy. I think they pretty much showed you, like especially in that one of the earlier scenes where the pirates come and they basically pillage and kill all those people in Port Royal. But it, as in all movies, any pirate movie that you're going to see like this, the pirates are going to be glamorized like like Jack or his crew. Like, oh, at the end, the crew decides to not go by the code and come back and rescue him before he gets hanged. You know, like, no, that's not very, that's not very true to life, but we, it wouldn't be very interesting I mean, it, it, it's not that kind of movie. This is uh, an adventure movie, and you want to know, in an adventure movie, 
you you want to be able to root for your favorite character, and it's hard to root for your favorite character if they're just bloodthirsty, awful people. Because I think just um, in regard to fantasy, we can reconcile more with the fact that our favorite character is a thief than if he's a murderer. So that's kind of the way they build up Jack. Like, well, he might be a pirate, but he's definitely not the worst pirate. You know, like he's not going around marauding and whatnot. So he, he's really not the worst. Yeah. Um, except when Norrington's like, you're the worst pirate ever. La, 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 la. Uh, but not worse in that way. Not like worse as in like a terrible person. As in worse as in no. like you're bad at your job. But, well, yeah, that was, that was the joke, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then what, that was also kind of funny, like how he escaped and the other guy was like, that's like the best pirate I've ever seen. Uh, yeah. And the, yeah, the comedy, the, the, the way this, this movie, like this series, honestly, this franchise is able to weave together levity with um, with more serious um, tones. Like especially as the movies continue, um, the tone gets fairly dark in regard to some of the character arcs, which is interesting. But they still manage to keep that light tone. I think they kind of they kind of um, engineered, I suppose, the kind of witty banter that the Marvel movies have become so well known for. But personally, I think they, they balance it a lot better than the, than the Marvel movies do. So it's interesting to see, because uh, cause the wonderful thing about Jack's character is that he can be serious, but most of the time, like, he's cracking jokes, he's very... Um, and it's just it's interesting watching... The comedic timing, I think, is just very well done in this movie. It doesn't feel forced. It doesn't feel overused. It, it's just... It's, it's nice. It's a nice breather, and it feels right in regard to the whimsical feel of the of the movie. If it wasn't as whimsical, it'd feel out of place. But the whole movie is very, very whimsical. So oh, yeah. I, I absolutely love the comedic acts aspect. Oh yeah, and this film timing is everything. Like all the all the comedic hits needs to be like timed perfectly, and they were. Um, another point I would like to get on is the idea of Turner's lineage that his father was a pirate but he was all like no my father wasn't a pirate and then he was and then sparrow was like yes he was and you are destined to become a pirate yourself and he's like never and then he ends up actually kind of becoming one uh what do you think of that well i think you know the the thing that uh, will, will set the thing that um jack tells will I love that scene where he, he tells Will who his dad was, that he was a pirate, and Will's unwilling to budge in that. I love the writing. It's, it's so clever. I love it. He goes, you, he, when he says, uh, put it, and he pulls his sword on them, and then he says, well, put it away, son. It's no use. You didn't beat twice in a day. And he goes, well, you didn't beat me. You didn't, you ignored the rules of engagement of fair fight. I'd kill you. And then Jack Sparrow goes, well, that's not much incentive for me to play fair. And, and then, then everyone goes like, so, oh. It's not just that it's funny. It's <laughs> And I, I, I love clever writing. It's not cheap laughs, it's clever laughs. But anyway, and it, then he knocks him off the ship and makes him like he's dangling on that um, yard arm, I guess. But uh, and he's telling him, look, there, there are two things you can do. There's what a man can do and what a man can't do. And he says, you can either accept the fact that your father was a pirate and a good man. So that was the whole point. Your father was a pirate, but he was also a good man. And when uh, Will rescues or tries to rescue Jack from the gallows. Um, and the governor confronts him for it. He goes, he's a pirate, and he goes, and a good man. So I think that's kind of the arc that we see in Will. We have this good man, and the goodness in him has pressed him to go against what the law deems necessary because he's following his own moral compass instead of what the law has um, laid out. And that can get kind of blurry in regard to, like, morality and whatnot, but I don't really think this is a type of movie where you have to think about it that hard. It's more the idea that um, Will didn't know where he came from, and he has this... You you can see throughout the character... I love Will Turner's character. I love those characters that are just shamelessly out to do the right thing. I think that's great because they're not simple characters. Sometimes that makes them, you know, do more foolish things because they think they're doing what's right. But I digress. Um, Anyway, uh, when uh, when Will is... uh, You know, he, he finds out that his father is a pirate, you know, all his life he's striven, he's, he's always striven to be a good man and a good citizen, and now he's realizing that maybe being a good man and a good citizen isn't always the same thing. Oh, yeah. 
Um, it also kind of de- well, it's also kind of uh, that thing where when uh, Jack saved Elizabeth from drowning, and then as soon as they he rescued her, like resuscitated her, uh, the governor found her, and as soon as he said like, "Oh look, I think he's a pirate," and then he's like, "Fucking shoot him in the head." And right after yeah. he saved him, saved her daughter, he was like, "Shoot him! Shoot him dead!" <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah. You're, you're no, I just think, I, yeah. I mean, and yeah, there, there's that there, and I think it's, it's it, like we can draw a lot of conclusions from all of that, but in the end, I don't think it's a kind of movie where you're supposed to think quite that hard about it. But I do think it's interesting to see how, you know, he's a pirate, but he's it, it, it does show you how, like, you know, they're. They're making. They're clearly even in a movie where you know pirate is a pirate. It's still a criminal in the at the end of the day. But in regard to a movie where there aren't quite the rules that we have in real life, by showing that he's not a killer, we see that he's still a good guy. If mm-hmm. that makes sense. Oh yeah. Um, do you, also, the thing with uh, the character of Norrington. Did you find it kind of strange that he wanted to marry a girl that he, she knew that when she was like eleven years old? Was that kind of strange to you? Um, no, I don't think it was strange, actually, because in that time period, that actually makes total sense. Okay. Um, I guess if we're to think that she was like 12 when they were on that ship and he was, say, 20, 22, um, then when she was 20, he was like 30 in his 30s, you know, and having a 15 to 20 year age gap was not uncommon in that time when it came to to marriage, women were married off very young, guys weren't necessarily, you know, they went and they got a career and then they got married, so it actually makes total sense, I think, that um, he would seek after Elizabeth, and I do think he actually genuinely cared for Elizabeth, that's something that we also get to see as the movies progress, Norrington's character art is is actually a, a very interesting one as the movie's go on because he's kind of viewed as an antagonist in this and in a way he is but at the same time in a way him and Will are very very similar but in the end Will decided to follow Will decided to go against the law to get the woman that he cared about and Norrington wasn't quite able to let go of his duty in order to to do that yeah and one of the things I found really kind of funny in that uh, flashback scene is when we first see uh, Weatherby, uh, Elizabeth's dad, um, and he's and he has the wig, but it's like brown, like it's like black <laughs> brunette colored. And I'm like, dude, I know that was a wig. Why are you trying to say that that's your real hair? <laughs> and, then, and then in the actual film, <laughs> he's like the white. He has the white wig. <laughs> I'm like, what's the deal well, with that? No, he's old for sure. Uh huh. Oh yeah, definitely. The the audience would never have gotten that. Uh, but what did you guys, what did you think of the character of Elizabeth? What did you think of her? Elizabeth, I absolutely love Elizabeth's character because I think it's very easy in movies like these to, to not, not necessarily oversell strong female characters, but instead of, in the, in the attempts of making them strong, they instead come off as obnoxious. And I think that's a real that's a real tragedy because, um, you know, we're missing out on some great female, strong female characters because people are making them too, I guess, stereotypical strong, I suppose. And with Elizabeth, I think they do a great job of not doing that. Elizabeth is just naturally strong. She, yes, and and at the beginning, like, you see her kind of following what her dad tells her to do. You know, she's, she's, you know trying to fit into society, but in this adventure we see that she is more than capable of, you know, standing up for herself, and, you know, she's very intelligent, clearly, and that intelligence, like, transfers over to her, to her general strength overall, and it's cool to see how this adventure, like, this traumatic experience of getting kidnapped and all that jazz, like, it's brought out in her an even greater strength. Like, it's it's not so much that it, like, made her strong, but it rather unlocked the strength that she already had or furthered that strength that she already had. So it's really cool to see that because she's so independent and she's able to manipulate the situation kind of like when I love the I love the part where her and Jack are um trapped on the island 
and she basically tricks him into drinking too much so she can burn all the stuff and make a and, and make a, 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 a you know a signal or whatever so they can find him like this is a very intelligent woman she she knows how to use the situation so that for for, for, the, for her best interest and, and but I mean at the same time we see that she's also soft you know she clearly cares she has a soft side too she clearly cares about will she didn't want him to die she was gonna marry that other dude just to make sure that he didn't die and so I think it's just I think she's a very well-rounded character and it's even more interesting to see how that grows in the in the further movies uh-huh oh yeah in the first movie she becomes like queen of the pirates king of the pirates king of the pirates oh excuse me I'm sorry yeah uh, <laughs> um so also like she when she got into the pirate ship she like did the whole parlay thing and she was like taken there of her own i guess free will kind of uh more or less yeah that's why i did that whole parlay thing in, in the beginning of the episode because that's what that's what oh, yeah, i, I figured <laughs> so um and then he was she was taken by uh those two goofy pirates one with the glass eye and the oh, other guy i love those characters that's another thing that i feel pirates of the Caribbean does so well they give us these lovable side character as well that are just as entertaining that light up the screen every time you see them it's wonderful oh yeah um did you particularly like those two characters those two pirates oh yeah i think they're great i think a lot of good movies need some you know uh, good good movies often have enjoyable side characters like you know they're not they're not what everyone wants to see the entire movie obviously but uh what, what happens is like you know, you give just enough of them so that you're clamoring for more of them by the time they're back on the screen, and that's so cool. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, another thing, it was the character of Gibbs. We see him in the beginning saying, oh, he, he, the pirates, they're bad. Ah. And then uh, the next time we see him, he's like, pirates, I love them. They're the best. I affiliate myself with them all the time. <laughs> what was that about? Well, I mean, I think it's clear that Gibbs wasn't very high in the... I wouldn't say that he was probably like a military sailor at the beginning. He was probably just a hired hand. So he didn't like the idea of pirates, but he likes the idea of making a buck more. Ah, okay, I get it. Um, I remember when I was when I was younger and the there, were this, there was this like Disney monthly magazine thing um, that they, I would receive and they would have like comics and stuff in it, uh, like collections of comics. And in there, there was a couple of Pirates of the Caribbean themed, uh, comics that was supposed to answer some, fill in some plot hole questions, you guess you can say from the film, like questions that you might not have seen on screen. Like, where did Jack Sparrow get the compass? And in the beginning of the second film, how did how did the two pirates escape prison with the dog? Uh, that was explained in that comic, in that comic series. Interesting. Yeah, and uh, and I have a feeling that that transition between uh, the flashback and the modern day was also answered in the comics, but I just didn't read it. But I like your idea more that he just liked money more than he hated. He disliked pirates, and he was willing to do it that way. Well, yeah, he's a he's clearly a simple man. Like mm -hmm. he's he's depicted as the simple everyday man, and the simple everyday man, he's just you know he's trying to survive, trying to get by. So you know, piracy isn't isn't out of his range of what he'll be willing to do. But again, you know, we have that Gibbs is clearly not the average pilot. He's a pirate. He's not the bloodthirsty pirate, but he's definitely definitely a thief. Uh-huh. Um let me think. Um I was gonna say something. So Barbosa, what did you think of him? Great villain? Oh or Barbosa best villain? is a wonderful villain. <laughs> Uh, how so? Well, he's just, um, there's something about a good villain. The thing is, I, I, I heard it said once, uh, a good movie is only as good as the bad guy is bad. 
And yeah. I think that Barbosa definitely lives up to that because he's not he. <laughs> He's, he's, a, he's a complex villain, and you don't usually have time to delve into stuff like that in a movie of this kind, but he's just a good villain. He's one of those villains that just, and I think it's because he's played by such an incredible actor, and it's just every time he's on screen, you know, you can't get enough of him. Yes, he's awful, and he wants to, you know, kill our heroes and squash their dreams, but he's got a comedic edge to him, and he's got a darker side to him, and then you see there's a little bit of humanity in him as well, that you see in his longing to end this curse and end this lack of feeling, you know. So that's what I think makes Barbosa such a good good villain because he's not just, he, he doesn't play it straight villainy. He's, he's funny, he's funny, he's twisted, he, hum, he's, he's so humane. It's, it's interesting, and every second he's on the screen, he just manages to, like, capture you with his, you know, the way he talks and the way he carries himself. So I think a lot of it is a great actor. Oh, yeah. And then uh, and then we see him in the other films uh, when he actually becomes more of a good guy, kind of. Yeah, and I think that just adds to how interesting a character he is overall. Uh-huh. Um, and also in the end of the, like at the end of the second film when he comes back and they're like, how is he back? He just is. Don't worry about it. <laughs> just, <laughs> we got to get that... You got to get that star power to get that box office moolah. Uh, yeah. And there's this actually one line. It's my favorite line in the entire film that he says. And it was like, you best start believing in ghost stories. You're in one. Oh, oh yeah, that's a great one. That was so dope. And he like friggin' gets out like a bottle of rum and then chugs in. You see the, 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 the wine, I mean the rum just pouring out of his like his rib cage and just like dripping on the floor is like so cool so cool looking oh yeah and uh the thing about the curse I, uh, his motivation uh, to his goal is is very understandable because the way he describes the curse it sounded like a very painful thing uh and i would i would understand why you would want to get rid of it because uh i don't know if i could ever imagine just spending my entire life just feeling hungry and not being able to eat and not being able to die of hunger i'm just always hungry no matter what and uh, and in addition to being always thirsty but never being able to die of thirst or never even being able to drink anything i'm just always thirsty and always hungry that sounds yeah. really awful yeah, I, I think that's probably a lot of what makes a good villain. It's when you can almost root for them. Not quite, but almost. But you can understand where they're coming from. Yeah. Um, what did you think about the scene where Jack becomes like a skeleton? A skeleton? Oh, I love that moment. It's such a great moment. Because, um, well, I think it's not necessarily this moment that makes it so cool, but it's the moment before where he... Um, where he takes the coin and nobody notices, but Will, it's in that moment that you realize, oh, okay, Jack, Jack, Jack is a good guy. He is on Will's side. He's not going to betray Will, you know. And so then you're just waiting for something to happen. You're waiting to make sure that he did actually take that, um, take that coin and in that moment. Because for half a second, when Barbosa stabs him, like you can't help it. You you have a bit of a, you know, you can't help but react if you're like, oh no. But then he stumbles, but it doesn't last long. He stumbles back and he's a skeleton. And it's just as cool. Oh yeah, um, and then it was kind of really fun to see how he used the curse against them for their own, for the for the good guys' benefit. Yeah. All right. You have any other thoughts about the the film at all? Uh, no, I don't know. I guess the one thing would be like the love story between Will and Elizabeth. I think it's. I think it's a great. Uh, I think it's a great. I think it's a great romance. It's one of my favorites when it comes to cinema. Yeah, yeah. What did you think about Will really like saving Jack at the end? Oh no, I think that's great. I think that totally fits with his character type. He's always out for someone else, and in this moment, like Jack has helped him so much, he wanted to perhaps even like against his better judgment wanted to save him he couldn't not save him after you know he had fought by his side and stood by him and helped him find elizabeth yeah because there's like this sense of camaraderie between the two like mm -hmm. there's a pretty good arc with them 
first like they he hated Jack because of he, he was a pirate and everything. Um, but it turns out that they were not that different at all and they became like more like brothers in arms in a sense. So now he feels like he has to has to save them. Okay, we're back. All right. Okay, awesome. All right. We kind of lost the by the the microphone kind of died on us, but we were talking about the uh, score of the Pirates of the Caribbean, and uh, you were saying that it felt really piratey, right? Yeah, it's just very upbeat and yet so intense. It's still very swashbuckling esque, so it totally works for the timbre of the film. Oh yeah, I remember when I was in my uh, when I was working for Disney, I was stationed at whenever I was stationed at the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Right, that's all that would play was the score to this film, and it was it was pretty catchy, especially like some of the some of the scenes, I mean some of the music, especially the ones that would go like, but uh, but uh, but uh, and that was that was pretty fun. It was really really easy music to get into. Yeah. All right. So our final thoughts in the film. Well, I mean, it's a great film. Definitely go watch it if you. Um, yeah, it's a great movie. Oh yeah, watch it now on Disney Plus. It is great, and uh, I would rate it a, a seven out of ten. What would you rate it? Uh, I'm giving a nine out of ten. Ooh, a nine out of ten. That's a, that's yeah, a good score. That's, yeah, it's a good movie. Yeah, and a good score for a good movie. All right, I've been Nathaniel Avila. This is Timberland. Yeah, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye.